story time. I cut my hair. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Okay, okay. And while I did indeed cut my hair, and I mean that quite literally, I, I do have a real story for you and this is a good one. A couple of months back, Dan Maloney over at Hackaday.com reached out to me asking if I would like to be the host of something that they have called Hack Chat. Now, I'd never really heard of Hack Chat up to this point, so I immediately researched it. And it's this really cool thing where they invite interesting people to come and host. And, and it's like an old school chat room where you can ask them questions about what they're doing and get insight. And it's a really great way for the electronics and hacking community to get together and talk to each other. And there were a couple of things that just blew my mind about this. The first was that Usagi Electric had garnered enough attention to catch the eye of somebody like Dan over at Hackaday. That just, that absolutely blew my mind. And then I started looking at all of the guests that they had had up to that point, and all of a sudden, imposter syndrome set in something fierce. I just couldn't believe that Dan would ask me to be a host after looking at some of the names that had already hosted. But, like I was gonna say no, so of course I said yes. And in December, the hack chat started. And it was only an hour long, but I was typing furiously and there was tons of fantastic questions coming and going. And it just so happens that Curious Mark, yes, the Curious Mark, the gentleman who runs one of the best electronics YouTube channels out there, also joins hack chat. And he started asking me questions. And I was going nuts. I was talking to Curious Mark, the Curious Mark. And so we were exchanging ideas and talking about projects and things. And it was just a fantastic time. And I cannot express how great and fun it was and how grateful I am to Dan for inviting me to do it. That was just phenomenal. But it's only the beginning of our story. During the hack chat, there was a little bit of a lull near the end, and I took that opportunity to ask a question to Curious Mark. It's no secret that we've been doing a ton of work based around the Motorola MC14500 chip. It's a little one-bit microprocessor, and I'm trying to recreate it with vacuum tubes, and I'm also building up a small version of it on a breadboard. And so I'm really enamored with this chip, but there's a couple parts of the chip that are remaining kind of beyond my grasp. I couldn't quite figure out how they did a couple of things because there's a lot of stuff going on inside the chip that's not indicated by LEDs or, or flags on the outside that I can see. And the, the chief among which was, how did the chip handle skipping instructions? I know that the chip has the capability to skip the next instruction, which must mean that it has a skip register on board. But how exactly did it go about skipping that instruction? I, I, I don't know. I can't tell. And so during that hack chat, I decided to ask Curious Mark what would be entailed with decapping the chip. He has a fantastic video on decapping chips using essentially fire which is hilarious and awesome. Uh, you, you heat it up and break it in two and split it apart and then take a picture of the die. Now, I was going to give this a shot. That was kind of a waste because if you mess it up, you destroy the chip. But uh, I, I didn't really know any other way to decap a chip. And for those of you wondering, decapping just means to get rid of all of the plastic on the chip. So we can look at the actual silicon and take a picture of it. And so, instead of chancing it with this fire method, uh, Curious Mark said, why don't you just send me the chip and we'll decap it and take a picture of it for you. <laughs> My brain exploded. I said, absolutely. I shot, him, I shot him an email almost immediately. And so began one of the craziest email chains I've ever been a part of. Mark sent me his address, I shipped the chips off, and then he got some very special people involved. First was he CC'd in Ken Sharif. Ken Sharif is a legend, an absolute wizard when it comes to reverse engineering things. I am convinced, he might say otherwise, but I am convinced that Ken can reverse engineer anything you put in front of him. The man is an absolute genius. 
And for him to be involved in this email chain and, and talking directly with him, my brain is melting. The fact that I'm able to communicate with these such giants in this industry, in this field, is just amazing. What an unbelievable opportunity. But here's where things get really interesting. They also included a gentleman by the name of John McMaster. And he is the gentleman who decapped the chip for us. He essentially uses a chemical to strip away the plastic of the chip, exposing the silicon dye. And then he can take a picture of it. And sure enough, after uh, a couple of weeks, the first picture came in. And wow, what an unbelievable shot. But uh, probably like some of you watching, I had no clue what I was looking at. I'm looking at this going, oh, oh, where do I even start? And so talking with John and talking with Ken, they were going, we probably need to de-layer the chip to figure out what's going on. And so what de-layering is, is that the, the silicon that's inside the, the chip on the die there is, is in multiple layers. And the top layer is where all of the metal traces are. And that's what, what you can see here in this picture. You can see all the little white spots are the, the metal lines. And so they use another chemical to strip those away exposing just the silicon underneath. And by looking at that silicon, we can now discover what are uh, P wells, N wells, all sorts of really difficult, insane things to wrap your head around for uh, figuring out a chip. But with those two photographs, now you can figure out how a chip works. And sure enough, John delayered it, sent us the picture, and then the real fun started started working with Ken trying to figure out exactly what we were looking at. And Ken is an absolute legend. He took the time to walk me through what I was looking at, how I could pick out certain types of transistors, what kind of weird techniques were being used, because this is a CMOS chip, which is, means that it's constructed a little differently than I'm used to thinking about in my old noodle up here. And Ken was patient and wonderful and just absolutely legendary with talking me through this. I was an absolute beginner. I'd never looked at a die shot before and he took the time to explain it to me. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. But it means that we have some fantastic information. So let's hop into it. Let's take a look at these die shots and figure out what is what. Now, I'm not smart enough to have figured all of this out alone. As a matter of fact, Ken did 99% of the, the heavy lifting here, and he has made a fantastic blog post about this chip over on his website, which is uh, rido.com. So definitely go there and read the blog post because you're going to get way more in-depth and detailed information than you'll ever get out of me. But I'm going to pick and choose a little bit of the information from his blog post and sprinkle in a little bit of my own revelations and hopefully we can figure out some really interesting things. Okay, so first and foremost, this is the first die shot that we received. And, well, it was kind of hard to figure out what was going on. It came down to a lot of pattern recognition, but even then I was just guessing. So the best place to start was to try and figure out where each of these large pads around the periphery went. These are the pads that connect up to the connection wires that ultimately go to the pins of the chip. I was racking my brain about it trying to figure out which pin was which, because they all looked identical to me. And ultimately, after several hours, I did come to a conclusion, figure it out, and kind of extrapolate what was what. And then Ken pointed out that the pin number one was the one pin that was uh, shaped differently. <laughs> so you can see that this, this pin number one over here is not a perfect square like the, <laughs> the rest of them. <laughs> so we have reset write data, and then we have our four instruction inputs, ground, flag F, flag O, return, jump, two clock signals, result register, and then power. And once I knew power and ground, I thought it would be best to trace out where the power and ground metal went. And that's what this trace out is here. And you can see that the power and ground paths are uh, quite convoluted. Now, based on this and based on the proximity of the pins, I was able to figure out a few things. Like, for example, I could figure out that this was the instruction register over here. And then I ventured to guess that this was the uh, logic unit next to it here. Uh, and then there was some 
duplicated looking stuff over here. So I thought that maybe the input enable register and the output enable register were stuffed over here. And that was really just my guesses based on just this top layer. And so when John sent us the delayered picture of just the silicon, things started to become a little clearer because now I could see what was underneath all of those metal traces. And things started to get difficult because now I was trying to discover where actual transistors were. But Ken, being the absolute wizard he is, actually identified a large majority of these pieces. And I was well and truly pleased with myself when I saw this because it means that I was able to identify quite a few pieces based on just pattern recognition. And so pardon me while I pat myself on the back. But the instruction decoding takes up far more space than I was expecting. As a matter of fact, it looks like it takes up about two thirds of the chip. Ken does provide a little more insight about this on his blog, so definitely go check that out. Now, what I had thought was the input enable register and the output enable register was actually there, but there was, there was also a lot more within there. I had somehow in my brain imagined the registers being much bigger than they actually were. You can see he identifies IEN and OEN here as just being on the bottom half of that. And then moving all the way to the bottom, the clock was actually probably the easiest thing to identify because it has a large pad here on the bottom that acts as a capacitor. So that was the internal clocks. And then the result register is, is stuffed right next to it, predictably as close as possible to the RR pin. So now before we move off of this, the one thing that probably stands out the most of this chip are these huge squiggly lines over here. These are just really large transistors that can move a lot more current than some of the other transistors. So probably the most interesting part of this entire chip is going to be the logic unit because the logic unit has to essentially handle some pretty complex logic. And I had already designed a logic unit based off of a multiplexer design for use with the tube version that I'm building. But I was curious how the actual chip built the logic unit up. And Ken, in his wonderful brilliance, actually reverse engineered the logic unit. So let's take a quick look at that. So this was Ken's logic diagram that he came up with. And this is, I think, called an and or invert type of logic. And it looks really strange to me because I, I've been building everything out of just single NOR gates lately. But talking with Ken, it's much, much simpler to build this in CMOS logic than it is like to say, build it out of tubes. And so I got on Logisim as a program to simulate this using the, the logic gates that were available in the program, and it worked awesome. And when compared to my version, it actually looks far more complicated. It's certainly more gate intensive, but you gotta remember with CMOS logic, it was actually keeping the transistor count down to build it this way. And I've been talking about CMOS logic and how things are really different with CMOS logic. And they are, they're incredibly different, especially when compared to the vacuum tube logic that we've been building. CMOS logic is a little weird. So Ken does an awesome job of outlining CMOS logic on his blog. And essentially this is what an inverter looks like from a silicon point of view on the chip. And so this image at the top here is essentially like a cross section of the board. Like we cut it in two and we're looking at it on edge. So the substrate is all in-channel substrate, which means that for NMOS type transistors, there needs to be a well of essentially P-doped silicon. And so to create an inverter out of CMOS logic, you use two transistors, a PMOS transistor and an NMOS transistor. Our input comes into the gate and then the, the drain of one and the source of another are connected in the middle and that's our output. And so we either turn one transistor on or the other one on. And depending on which transistor's on, the output is either pulled up to VCC or pulled down to ground. And the action is the opposite of whatever the input is. So this is a basic inverter. So I fundamentally understand how this works. I'm terrible at explaining it, which is why you should go read Ken's blog. But I have a basic idea. If we remember at the very beginning of all of this, what I was most confused about was how the chip handled skipping instructions. And Ken gave me a little nugget of information that sent me down a path that allowed me to run. 
And he essentially let me know that instructions are skipped by essentially cutting off the input into the instruction register. So I wanted to take a look at how that actually worked and see if maybe I could reverse engineer a little bit of it. So let's zoom in on just one of these and we can start to see some connection. So the instruction from memory that has been chosen by the program counter is being input into this pin and it comes down to here and then goes underneath these next three lines, two of which are power and ground. And then it connects up over here to this one. And so we can see that pretty much all of this is the metal for this part of it. So we've got all the metal highlighted. Let's turn those layers off and let's turn off the metal layer itself and take a look at the silicon underneath. And at first it seems incredibly difficult to understand. But with a little bit of thinking, we can start to pick out transistors because each transistor only has three pins. So if we look at this little group here in the middle, we can see some very interesting things. The first is that these are vias that connect up to the metal above it. And then here in the center, it looks like a space, but if we look really, really closely, we can see that there's a little something extra on the edges of both of these. And that is the gate of this transistor. All right, and so now if we start looking at all the other lines around here, we can start to identify gates really easily just by looking for that slightly different colored edge. And let's also highlight all of the pads that they connect to. Now, because I'm kind of making this up as I go along, the yellow are bits of the transistors that I'm not entirely sure where they go to yet, but there are certain parts of the transistor that very obviously connect to either power or ground. And that's what the brown and blue are. Blue are direct connections to ground and brown are direct connections to power. And so now let's overlay the metal on top of this and get a look at the entire picture. All right, so we started with something that looked fairly simple and now we're into something that looks maddeningly complex, but it's just a matter of essentially connecting the dots. And so just by following the purple lines, we can figure out what's connected to what. And then by following the yellow and the light blue and the light brown, we can figure out which source goes where and which drain goes where. And so while this looks incredibly complicated, I started to get a feel for where transistors were sitting and what they were connecting to. And so I may be completely wrong, but I gave it a shot at trying to draw out which transistors were which and what they were connected to. And this was the result. Now, compared to what we were looking at in the silicon, this actually looks really simple. <laughs> uh, but essentially we have two inverters right on the front here. And then the output out of the second inverter goes to this really interesting arrangement here. And it's actually just a third inverter with an additional transistor sitting in between this lower transistor and this upper transistor of the inverter. And there's also an additional transistor here on the output that could potentially pull it up to VCC. And both of these transistors feed into our skip line that's coming from down in the bowels of the chip where the latches are either telling it to skip or not to skip. But whether there's a signal coming into that chip can control whether our, our instruction register output will output anything at all or whether it's being pulled directly to VCC. And that is actually surprisingly simple. We, we just essentially have three inverters and two transistors to control whether the final inverter is outputting anything or whether it's just outputting a high logic level. So what an insane design. We reverse engineered this by just looking at pictures of the silicon. How cool is that? Now, unfortunately, I don't have any uh, field effect transistors in my collection, so I can't really build this up on a breadboard to test it out. But there is a lot of fantastic software that allows you to essentially build these circuits and test them out. 
So this is a website called Falstep, which is a fantastic simulation website that you can access in your browser and use for completely free. So I've set up that circuit that we reverse engineered here in Falstad to give it a shot. And I'll include a link below so you guys can play with this as well. Now, right now, our skip pin is off. So no matter what instruction is coming in, you could see that our output, which is this long wire here on the right, isn't changing. So we need to turn the skip switch on. And now, Look at that. The output is changing. So there we go. We have successfully reverse engineered the skip portion of the MC14500. And I'm going to use something very similar to this, although much less complicated because I'm dealing with tubes and that actually affords me a certain level of simplicity. So this has been incredibly insightful. And I cannot state enough how grateful I am to Curious Mark, to Ken Sharif, and to John McMaster for helping me with this. They went above and beyond the call for a little old me. I am completely humbled by it, but what an amazing experience. See, I told you it would be a good story. So thank you guys so much for joining today. And even though we didn't get the breadboard out and build anything today, we learned a colossal amount about how actual IC chips are built. So in the next episode, we're definitely going to get the breadboard back out. But in the meantime, I'm going to keep playing with these die shots, these beautiful images from John, and hopefully we'll see you next time.